Praise God. Praise God. Welcome to Lighthouse Christian Center Sunday morning worship service. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We praise God this morning for this wonderful day, for this opportunity that we may come to praise His name, to give Him glory, to give Him honor. This morning we're going to read to you from the book of Romans, chapter 5, and we will start at verse 19. And it's from the King James Version. And we'll read through chapter 6, verse 6. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, and the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized to Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the news of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity there, Lord, that we may lift our voices unto you, that there, Father, we may say words, there, Father, that will glorify you, that will touch the hearts of men, that we'll sing songs this morning, there, Father, that glorify you, there, Lord, that will mellow and plow the hearts of those Make us soft, O oh Lord. Let those who enter in this place of worship today, their Father, go out change, their Father. For you, their Lord, have touched their souls and their bodies, their Lord. And for those, their Father, that listen, their Father, by other medias, their Lord, we thank you, their Father, that you will touch them, their Lord. For you are the King of glory. Father, right now, we praise you, we give you. We ask you, their Father, to touch this service this morning, their Father. Let hearts be touched. Let hearts be changed, dear Lord. For you are Lord and God. Let us stand on your word, dear Father, and walk in the light that you provided for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome, welcome. Let us welcome back our praise team so that they may sing songs to the glory of God. Amen.
spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. A couple of reminders. Uh, we want to make you aware, of course, if you need a CD or digital download of today's message, see Brother Brown in the back. Uh, get CD orders take one week. Also, Brother Brown, if you don't mind, I, Sister Beer's CD is in there. So uh, she, uh, we have that available for her. Also, uh, we uh, want to give God praise. We thank God for all the birthdays in the month of August. Uh, all of us give God praise. Yeah, yeah. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. year. And uh, we want to celebrate you. Hopefully you can celebrate all month long to God be the glory. Also, our virtual Bible studies every Wednesday at 7 p.m. We send out a, loop, a link through Zoom. And now you can view our uh, Bible studies on YouTube. We also are in the midst of our sock drive. We have our bag there in the back. We want to make donations. Thank you for those who have already donated, either financially or by bringing socks. We will run the sock drive through November the 19th. Uh, today is Children's Church, and next Sunday, I want you to come out, bring a friend, bring a loved one. We're going to celebrate the ordination and installation of Brother Swift. He'll be our very first assistant pastor of Lighthouse Christian Center. So this is upcoming Sunday. We want to celebrate him and all the hard work he's done, and we're going to give God praise for what he is doing in his life. I don't have it up here, but I also wanted to uh, uh, make everyone aware, make sure you stay cool, make sure you stay hydrated. There's a heat advisory today, probably the next few days, and so if you're out and about, make sure you uh, get us some shade, fix that AC unit, whatever the case may be, we want everyone to remain safe. Bless his name. All right, I believe that's all we have. As far as our visitors, we'll give you an opportunity to give. Thank you for those who have already given online, for those who are virtual and I, I thank God, um, not that you have to give online, but we have some people who you may not see, but they give faithfully, consistently. Thank you for those who mail in offerings or those, again, who give online. It is greatly appreciated. We, we really couldn't, and this is not a, a <laughs> an overstatement or an exaggeration. We, we couldn't do it without you. It takes the faithful tithes and offerings of uh, God's precious people. I'll read a verse here. Uh, very familiar out of uh, Matthew chapter number 6. As we give Matthew the 6th uh, chapter, verse number 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. All right, we give you an opportunity if you have an offering envelope, you can prepare that and we will come back and pray with you there. I will. I 
Christ. Praise God. Got some help over there today. We can rest on our feet as we go to the Lord in prayer. Once again, Father, we thank you. We bless you. Thank you as we bring our faithful tithes and offerings unto you. We know that you will bless us as a result. And we understand this is an indication, a sign of where our heart really is. As we make eternal investments, as we invest into your kingdom, we thank you, Lord, for the harvest of blessing, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. We thank you for allowing us to participate in the furtherance of your kingdom. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you all of the glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, let's give God praise. God praise he comes back up as we go to a special musical selection. Amen. Praise the Lord.
Unfortunately, 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. Um, this blew me away because when I did some research, just looking at the churches in America, this probably is the same in the world. Only 10 to 25% of congregations actually tithe. Um, it's amazing. I was probably thinking of maybe 50, but in congregations across America, only 10 to 25 percent of the people tithe. That's why serving in ministry is important because again, it involves your tithing and giving. So when you see, you know, mega churches on TV, you see churches that have you know hundreds and hundreds of people. Make no mistake about it; only only a quarter of them are probably tithing. Um, churches open all the time, but. Serving in ministry is important because 75 to 150 churches close every single week, every single week, that's something. And so that's why God wants us to be involved. Finally, I believe serving in ministry is important because it shows that we are invested in the Great Commission. That goes back to what I mentioned about being in church, and I believe, by the way, every person, believer, needs a church home. We can talk at length about that. A lot of people need to be, or everyone who is saved needs to be planted in a house of worship. I believe that it is definitely and absolutely problematic when you have people who name the name of Christ, people who claim to be saved. They're not in a local church. They're not in a church home. And also, they're not serving. And so in Acts chapter number six, we see an example of individuals or believers who served in ministry. This was when widows were being given food every single day. This was their food ministry, the distribution of their needs. And, and really, this is what serving looks like. And so what we're going to do very briefly, won't be before you all, we want to examine what serving in ministry involves, again, what it looks like, and what it takes out of us to be an active participant in what God has called each one of us to do. And so we again, you look at verse number two. It says, then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples. It says, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And so, you know, when you talk about serving in ministry, it involves helping to meet both the practical and spiritual needs of the church. In this passage, you have two groups of people, uh, two dynamics happening in one church. You had a group of people who were dealing with, with and addressing the practical needs of the congregation. And then you had another group that was dealing with the spiritual needs of the congregation. That's what serving in ministry looks like. And how many of you know in every church, you need to address both the natural and spiritual needs of the congregation. And so as a believer, you have to ask yourself, hey, where do I fall? How can I help? Has God called me to serve to address the practical needs of the congregation, which are very important? Or has God called me to help address the spiritual needs of the congregation, which is equally important. Again, you do need both for ministries to thrive. I, I've seen in churches where they do a good job meeting the natural needs. They have, you know, warming shelters. They have food distribution. They have all things they do in the community, and that's great. But oftentimes, they're lacking in the spiritual need. In addition, you have churches that address the spiritual needs. You have preaching and revivals and and praise and worship, all these things going on, but they don't address the natural or practical needs of their congregants. Again, you need both for churches and ministries and the body of Christ to thrive. Here at LCC, we have just as many people calling for assistance for rent and utilities as we do people calling for prayer. And so that's why serving in ministry is absolutely important. That's why God needs everyone involved. Again, churches are often understaffed. Again, there are challenges that we have. And so, as a reminder, we are, you and I, are the body of Christ, members individually. We are God's hands. We are God's feet. We are God's voice here on earth. I often ask myself the question, and I, I would challenge you to ask yourself the same question. If you were the only person that God was depending on to reach people for Christ, would God be in trouble? If I was, I'll put it on me, if I was the only person that God was depending on to move the needle, to advance the gospel, would God be in trouble? I think we have to ask ourselves that question because that really highlights what is at the core of serving in ministry. Again, in this passage, the early church, they were committed to help address the practical needs and spiritual needs of the congregation. I was talking to my father, and he had a lady in her church, a lady in his church, 
who had surgery and uh, was confined to a wheelchair. And it was a blessing what they were able to do. Now, again, you had people who had to give to help support. Again, that's, that's part of serving as well. And they were able to build a wheelchair ramp for her. Praise God. Other instances where uh, ladies, you know, a woman, I think she was a retiree on a fixed income, and she had a problem with her plumbing. They were able to help address that. Praise God. And so that's, that's what we're here for. We're here to address the spiritual needs. We're here to give people the word. We'll talk about that. But we also get to address the practical needs of people. You see it here in this passage. That's what serving in ministry involves. Verse number three. He says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And so when you talk about serving in ministry, it involves us, the church, the body of Christ, to address the natural, practical needs of congregants, people in general the general community. It involves us addressing the spiritual needs of people. And oh, by the way, if I can just stop here, there are a lot of spiritual needs we have. There are a lot of people who are depressed, frustrated, stressed out under the circumstance. There are a lot of people who are lost, feel they don't have any hope. That's where we come in. That's why God needs all hands on deck. How many of you know people need the Lord? They need Jesus. They need to be saved. They need to understand that they are redeemed. They have been redeemed. That there is a free gift afforded to them. And so we have to beat this drum as loud as we can. We have to blow this trumpet loud to let people know that Jesus saves. Every single day we walk across the path of people who don't have any kind of direction in life. Walking around without hope. Wondering what their purpose is. That is where the church comes in. That's why we have to serve. That's why we have to be involved. That's why we have to be engaged. Again, when we serve in ministry, it lets God know that we are invested in the Great Commission. And the world, mind you, can care less about the Great Commission. And so the ball is in our court. The box starts with us, you and I. Again, we're a extension of God. Again, where his hands, where his feet. And so we have to take our job seriously. What does it look like? It looks like a servant in ministry. And here we see that they sought out men and women, or we could argue, <laughs> in the congregation, individuals, I should say. That's a discussion for another subject. But notice the kind of people they were looking for. He said, therefore, verse 3, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. Full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom that we may appoint over this business. So in every church, there's business to be done. There need to be people who can address the practical side of ministry. I can't stress that enough. That's important. And I mentioned this before, that preaching uh, ministry in churches, uh, the whole work of the ministry is more than just preaching. According to this verse, it says we've got business to attend to. So we need business-minded people. We need people who don't mind focusing on the practical needs of the church, of the disciples. The Bible says that the disciples are growing and growing, and the more people come, the more work needs to be done. And so they said, we need people who can serve. And so number two, we see when you talk about serving in ministry, God needs committed Christians who are able to serve. Notice, just to serve and to distribute food. Just to address the needs of widows. The Bible says we don't just need anybody, we need committed believers. People of character, people of good reputation, people of integrity, people who are full of the Holy Ghost, not to preach, just to pass out food. People who have wisdom. And so in every church, in every congregation, in the entire body of Christ, God is looking for committed Christians who are able to serve. And that is, friends, the big elephant in the room. Because God is looking for people who can count on. He's looking for faithful people, committed people who can serve. Again, we are his very ambassadors by his hands and his feet. And so they were looking for specific kinds of people to address their needs who were willing to serve. And that's where we come in. 
And so you have to ask yourself the question, are you committed to God? Are you committed to your local church? Or are you a Sunday say, are you a faithful member of Bedside Baptist? Are you here to take on tomorrow, up one day, down the next? God can't count on you. You can't serve God. You're not faithful. You're not committed. You're not dependable. You're not reliable. The Bible says they were looking up because notice this. He said, I don't need people who are wishy-washy. I don't need people who are pass out food one day and then try to sell on the side the next day. I don't need people who will show up to serve the world one day and you can't find them next week. No, I need faithful people, committed people, dedicated people, people who can represent everything I stand for just to address these natural needs because sometimes if you don't address the natural needs of people, you will never have an opportunity to address their spiritual needs. And so this is finally important. That's why serving in our, in our churches is paramount. That is why sometimes, here I go, when we just stay home or remain disconnected, we are very selfish. We have to realize that, that the Great Commission, the body of Christ, God's mandate to us, is bigger than us. We're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And so when we are not engaged, we're not helping, we're not becoming part of the solution. We essentially become part of the problem. So God is looking for people who are committed to serve in ministry. It's just like the job. You know, they can't put you in a position they're not, they're not sure you're going to show up five days a week. They, they, can't, they can't rely on you to do a specific duty. <clears throat> they know that you're not punctual, if they're not sure if you're really dedicated to the company's mission, it's the same way. And so they said, we need, we, need, we need some committed people. Which tells me that in the church, in their congregation among the disciples, you had many disciples who weren't that committed. So we don't need them. I'm not saying they're not saved. But to handle this business, we, we, we not give them time to grow. We need some committed people who are willing to serve. That, that's what we need. That's, that's what God is looking for. I made an argument before that, you know, you know, we need God. God don't need us. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Because, again, God is in heaven. We're here on earth. We're the body of Christ. He said we're his ambassadors. We, we, we are the ones who have the ministry of reconciliation. We've been tasked with the Great Commission. God works through people. God works through the church, the body of Christ. But we have to be committed if we're going to serve. Verse number three again. He says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men. Let me say this is coming to mind. I, 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 I thought about this this week. I'm doing some work at a Christian school. And, you know, this kind of tells you the state of the body of Christ. I teach a couple classes there. And... Again, God, God is, is looking for people. Again, I mentioned this earlier that churches are often understaffed. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. 10 to 25% of congregations tied. Only 10 to 25%. Again, you see a mega church. Don't think all of them are helping. Don't, don't, don't be fooled by that. You, you see a congregation on TV and you see hundreds of people in the audience. All of them ain't, ain't doing anything. They're not. I remember going to a church, probably the biggest church I was a part of. And by the way, I've always served in ministry. Whether I was uh, in, in the youth choir, whether I was uh, a prayer, altar worker ministry, I did that as well. <clears throat> I think in one church, because I wasn't tied to still to this day, I was the youngest member of, it was about 25 years ago, I was the youngest member of the finance committee. So I was, I was there. They got to trust you to be a part of the finance committee. I did that as well. So I, I always... Did some things. I probably did some things. I did some things for my father in the church. Clean it. I cleaned. I cut grass. Done all those things. But when I, I was working with a, a, a private Christian school, and I was amazed. It kind of shows you the state of the church and the body of Christ. Again, Christian school now. Christian school. And there was a, a teacher who talked to a four-year-old boy student, and he was acting out. And the teacher said to him, "Like, listen." You need to start acting right, because I'm sure you're going to act this way in church. And the boy replied to her, said, ma'am, I've never been to church. I was like, whoa, I was like, double, whoa. Four years old at a Christian school. 
Christian school. <laughs> like what? I mean, you know, hell, bro, you got to explain that me. <laughs> How do you enroll? <laughs> How do you enroll your child? Y'all got to help me with it. How do you enroll your child in a Christian school and you don't go to church? Before he said, I've never. He didn't say, I don't go to church often. <laughs> he said, I have never been to church. And somebody say new school parents. <laughs> See, old school parents weren't like that, right, bro. The old school parents, new school parents, they don't come like they used to. Like our parents and families, for many of us, raised us. I was like, what? I was like, that doesn't make sense to me. They also said, and this shouldn't have surprised me a whole lot because I went to a Christian college. They said that you know I, I don't think you know at this Christian school I don't I don't think a lot of these kids actually go to church. <laughs> like what are, we, what are we doing? Like what, what are we doing? God God needs people to serve. God needs He needs committed people. What about the lost? What about the idea and the fact that the Bible says hell is enlarging itself? What about people who have never heard the mentioned name of Jesus? Not even one time. Where is the body of Christ? Where is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? What are we doing? And so he says we, we need people who are locked in. We need people who are faithful. We need people who are dedicated, not just to their job, not just to their friends, and not just to losing weight and becoming you know, more athletic, not just to making more money, but we need people who are committed to serving in church, serving so we can show God that we are invested in the Great Commission, that God knows that souls mean something to us. And God is looking for that in us, the body of Christ. These are people he died for. And so, if anyone ought to be concerned, it should be us. And so, therefore, I'm invested. Therefore, I'm locked in. Therefore, I help any way I can. I tithe, I give, I volunteer. Because I want to be part of God's solution. And so here, he says, I need people who are committed. Verse 3 and 4. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men, get this, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So again, you have two dynamics. Those in the church who are committed, who are faithful to address the practical, natural needs of the church. And then you have another group of people, and we need both, who are committed to address the spiritual needs of the church. I'm talking about people who deal with administration, people who deal with sales and breakdown, people who deal with finance, people who deal with administration. Then you got people who deal with prayer and intercessor and preaching and teaching the word of God. Two dynamics in one church, and you gotta have both. And so he says here that I need people who will serve and will address this business, but we will, the apostles said, give ourselves continually, we're not going to stop, to the prayer and ministry of the word. And so finally, when it comes to serving and ministry, we have to understand that the word of God is the priority. Everything is a means to that end. Even when we address the practical needs of people, it's just so we can give them the word. It's just so we can have an audience with them. It's just so we can open the door that they can hear the word of God. That is our why. Why do we serve in the first place, Pastor? This is why. Because people need the word. People need Jesus. People need the Lord. People need to be saved. People need Christ in their life. People need the Holy Ghost. That's our why. That's why we serve. Because it's the word that will set people free. It is the word that will bring about salvation, healing, and deliverance. It's the word that will bring about restoration in the lives of people. It is the word that can bring depression off of people. It is the word that can help bring people out of poverty. It is the word that can change our lives around and reshape the course of our destiny. So we need the word, and that is why we serve. So we can preach and teach the word of God, so we can disseminate the word, so we can give people the truth. That will set them free. And you see all this in this passage. They prioritize the word of God, but they didn't neglect the practical needs of the congregation of people. The other day, I'll say this. I had a, a, a colleague who, some foreign exchange teachers who were moving to the area, and they were looking for people to make donations because you know they were working in the area in the country, and I don't know if they ever come to church. They heard about me, but um, I said, hey, I can donate something. You know, we got a lot of stuff out of this 
place it's vocally a big big left lot of stuff and so I, I can we have symmetrical things. I can donate, you know, bed frame and and, and uh, donate a headboard and, and, and things of that nature. It's oh my god, oh my god, we, we need a car. I said, I, I got a guy for you. <laughs> I know somebody for you. I said, call Mark. I said, you know, somebody who goes to our church. You know, wink wink, goes to our church. <laughs> who can who can help? You know, and, and sometimes I say that because, you know, you never know that can be an avenue to tell them about Christ. You know, they may or may not ever come to church, but when they see how we help them with their practical need, you do know at that time, they didn't need to hear me rattle off John 3.16. They need a car. So I need a car in one week. That, that is the guidelines I have to have to pick up my green card, my social security number. They said we have to. If we're going to remain in the States. We have to. If we're going to remain here with, on this visa. I got to get a car. Okay? So at the time, she didn't need John 3.16. She needed, like we said last week, part of my social network that can help her. And I'm leveraging that network to be a blessing to her, to show her the love of Christ. And you never know, it may be an opportunity that I can share the Lord with her. And so th this is what it looks like. We, we have to address, we have to serve people in ministry. And in the back of our mind, we understand at the end of the day, if given the opportunity, we want to give them the word. Let me show you why this is significant in the moment of time. When you keep reading this passage for you Bible scholars, you gotta keep reading down past verse four. Even you need to go on to chapter seven. Because one of the men that they selected just to pass out food was a man named Stephen. Now, he just was trying to help them. You know, I know after, because he just was committed to serve in ministry. Oh my God, God used him mightily. This was an anointed man of God. He had no problem just serving. Nothing was beneath him. He was just passing out food. Why was that? That God used him in a mighty way. He was a gifted, anointed preacher and teacher of the gospel. This guy was just, just, just was helping to pass out food. The Bible said signs and wonders happened when he was preaching the word and ministering to people. Some argue because he was the first Christian martyr that he may have had more of an impact after his death than he did his life. 